the doctrine of love the brethren, uh, the love of God directed towards other believers. And as to the love of the brethren, we have no need for anyone to write to you. Why? Well, because they've already, they've already know this doctrine. They know about the love of God. Paul has taught them. You have no need for anyone else to teach you on that doctrine as far as new information. For you yourself have been taught by God to love one another. In other words, he said this doctrine of loving the brethren is not a new, new concept to the word of God. Just the direction of it. I mean, Jesus taught a lot on love. The Old Testament teaches a great deal about love. And people don't realize that. Uh, but the Old Testament teaches a great deal. Uh, Matthew 22, when you look at Matthew 22, for example, you're, you reflect back on the Old Testament. Uh, that's what G, his book was the Old Testament. The, the canon of Scripture that he had was the completed canon of the Old Testament. That was his Bible. You and I are so fortunate to have it completed. We have the completed Bible. He only had the, the first section of it in his ministry, and he used it really wisely. But he talked about it in Matthew 22. But he says, you've been, this is a standing doctrine of God throughout all the ages, beginning from the Adam to you today in the church age. You go, go through the Gentile age and the Jewish age and the church age, even to the millennial age. The, one of the great doctrines that God has always had is his love for man. And he wants the believer, those who accept him, he wants them to love others with the love that he loves, th loves them. I want you to pass it on. And this is a wonderful concept. And the doctrine of love is, is not new. It's directed in a dispensation a different way. But the love of God, listen, one of the characteristics, as we'll see in a moment, one of the characteristics or essence of God is love. And so, uh, certainly, the love that God had in his essence is passed to man. I mean, right out of the right out of the shoot, or we might say right out of the garden. So, it's not a new concept with God, uh, but the direction is love the brethren. A, a new, uh, and it's always been directed towards the believer, love the believers, love them supremely, love the world, love your enemies. You know, this. there's quite a list of what God requires about love. So that's what he means by he says, for you yourself are taught by God to love one another. And that's what he wants to talk about in this subject matter. He wants us to understand that the love that God has for you is the love that he put in you that he wants you to share with others. And we're going to talk about what that love is and how you do that today. Your life, one of the great characteristics of the Christian life should be love. It should be love. It should be love. The, it, it is the greatest of all the characteristics that we have to share with other people is the love of God. And we're going to talk about that today in, in these verses. Verse 10, for indeed you do practice it towards all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. That would be the geographical region of the church's ministry. We will soon be in Moody and Sinclair will be that for us. We will, we will station our headquarters as a church in Moody, but we're looking to Macedonia. We're looking to Sinclair County. We want to reach that whole county for Christ before uh, we, we, we move on to other, other great things with God in ministry. This is what Paul is saying. They, they lived in a place, but the region was called Macedonia. Their, their region, their, quote, their church field. And w when we moved to Moody in July, you need to understand that we headquarters, like we did here, we headquartered in Roebuck in a day when we had a, a great a great move and 
uh, and we, we want to stretch ourselves as far as we could reach. And, and, you know, we've reached across the state of Alabama and the southeast of the United States, and we've reached across into the world uh, through our ministries, still doing that. Only thing we're doing is moving our location. Uh, we're not as effective as we once were in Jefferson County. We're moving to another city and another county. Uh, it's just the right time to do it. And, and that's what Paul is encouraging these people. They, their, their ministry was Macedonia, and they were doing it. And listen, their ministry had gotten so well established in Macedonia that they were reaching uh, Archaea. They were reaching their whole, their whole, all of Greece, as we might say. They were reaching all of Greece, and their ministry out of that was touching Paul, uh, other churches all over in Asia, in uh, uh, over in the Palestine area. They, their ministry was was sounding forth, and Paul is talking about that in verse ten. You can read about this in the book of Acts. This is part of Paul's missionary program. For indeed, you do practice it to all your brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, listen to this. This is the second time he's used this word. Notice in verse 1, he used the word excel still more. And now he's used it again, excel still more. Excel still more. You say, well, Ron, I'm doing really good. <clears throat> We're doing really good. Mm, I don't know. Are we capable to excel even more? Even more. And so this is one of Paul's favorite lines. Let's excel. And so I entitled my lesson today, Excelling in the Love of God. Excelling in the Love of God. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get in to find out how does this actually work. What's the practice? You do practice it, he said. I love the idea that you are practicing the love. Of you are practicing it. What I want you to do is spread it out further. Spread it out further. Spread it out further. You understand? Spread it out further. Spread the love of God out further. And that's our, that's Paul's message to us today. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of God to our life so it can set us free from the cosmic system of lies and dysfunction in our life. I pray, Father, for these that have come by us by the automobile as well as the internet. They would pay attention today to Paul's message of excelling in the love of God. Spread it further out. Spread it. Don't, don't just hold it to yourself. Don't just hold it to your family. Don't just hold it to your church. Spread it out. Spread it out, the love of God. The world is starved to death for love. What makes the world go around? Not Coca-Cola, not Pepsi. And it's not human love. It's the love of God. Spread it out. Father, teach us to spread it out. Spread it out geographically. Spread it out as far as our life touches other people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, point number one, I got four points for you in the first service. The love of God is the oldest thing you could possibly attach yourself to that God said to attach yourself to in the character of God. We can't be, we can't be omniscient. We can't be omnipresent. We can't be omnipresent. It would be nice if we could be immutable and be nice if we could be racity. <laughs> we can't be sovereign. We can touch sovereignty every time God gives the directive will to us. We touch sovereignty. And sovereignty actually works in our life when we, when we obey the will of God and do it. We are righteous, but not absolute righteous because we come back and confess our sin to become righteous experientially again. We have eternal life, but we, not, we are not eternal life, but we have it. One day we will be it. In the meantime, we have human life. We have physical life. But love, love we have. 
we have the love of the character of God that's eternal. We do have it. And we have it in 100% form. We have the love of God. It's not the love of Ron. It's the love of God in Ron. It's not the love of Ron. It's the love of God in Ron that we're talking about. It's not, it's not the, you understand what I'm saying? And that love of God in you is 100% love. And you don't need to mess with it. Don't try to, don't try to, don't try to blend it with your ideas and all of that. It's 100% God. It's like grace. Grace is 100% God. The love of God is just like grace is 100%. And I want you to see that today. I want you to see that. And so I, I listed and I gave you a Bible scriptures on the essence of God. They may be different than the ones you have. I try to, I try to mix them up every once in a while uh, for you to see that these characteristics are talked about in many places of the Bible. So I try to go through them and, and change, change and show you different passages uh, that, where they are. <clears throat> Point number two. So we, 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 we understand that when we're talking about the love of God, we're talking about the love of God, all right? So point number two, excelling, the, the excelling love of God was put on display to the world uh, to see when God sent his only begotten son to be the propitious offering for the sins of the world. Now, that's a lot. So let me break it down and explain it. That's a whole lot of stuff. I just said a whole lot of stuff. It, this would take an hour in itself. So let me just explain what I'm talking about because my subject matter today is the love of God. The love of God was put on public display for them to see the love of God in John 3.16. In Romans 5.8. Now most of you understand or know John 3.16, for God so loved the world. that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son, his only begotten son, to the cross, to the grave, to the cross and to the grave. The only begotten Son of God was sent to the cross of death and buried in Sheol, Hades, Luke 16. That's what it means when God sent His God so loved the world that he sent his son to that world, the world of the human race. And he put him on display. He hung him on a cross for our sins, not his, and not just ours only, but the sins of the whole world hung on him on that cross. And he took the judgment for our sin. He made the propitious sacrifice. Listen to what propitiation means. He appeased the wrath of God against sin. He appeased the wrath of God against sin. How did he do that? That's what propitiation means. It means to appease the wrath of God. That's John 3.16. That, that goes to 36. That's John 3.16 carried over to John 3.36. Ah, well. Here we go. Might as well look it up, huh? 
Might as well look it up. You didn't bring your Bible. There's one in the pew. You know, it's Bible study. Kind of like the gym, Willie. If they don't bring their weights into the gym, you provide them. So if you didn't bring your Bible, we provide you one. But we want you to have a good spiritual workout. He, he who believes in the Son, this verse 36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. How do you get eternal life? You've got to believe in the Son. Now, you've got to know what the Son came to do, why the Father sent the Son. That's the gospel. You've got to know why he sent the Son, for God's so love worldly. Sent his Son. So he said, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, eternal life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's everybody in Adam. That's one of the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin on the human race. Propitiation is a wonderful word in salvation. When you believe the gospel that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, when you believe it, Romans 1, 16, the gospel is the power of God to save you. And therefore, you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Now, what you get is the 50 things that you can never lose in time and eternity in a little packlet called, you know, salvation. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, those 13 judicious of Adam's sin like the raft of God, condemnation, spiritual death, etc., is absolutely removed from your life once and forever because Christ died one death to take care of sin. And that's one part of the sin problem, Adam's sin. And you, for every 13th judicial charge, you have a promise from God about that, that it will never return to get you. Words like redemption, reconciliation, propitiation, justification, peace with God. You know what I'm talking about? Bro, you need to read that little pamphlet. That, that pamphlet's for, for you to study that and understand the awesomeness of your salvation. That's what it's about. And if you don't have one, we'll see that you, you get one. All right? And so, for example, in 1 John 2.2, 2, and he himself, that is alone, he himself, no one else, nothing else, he alone, is the propitiation for our sins. Now watch this. Watch this. And not only for ours only. You know what that means? In theology, that means unlimited atonement. Don't let anybody tell you that God saves some and don't say, listen, God's desire is to save everybody. 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance and faith. Understand that. There's a, there, that, that right there dispels this whole idea that some can be saved and some don't, all that kind of business. The grace of God wants to save everybody by faith. He himself is the propitiation, the appeasement of the raft of God, the 13 judicial charges, for our sins and not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. Write this down on your piece of paper. Write this down on your piece of paper. Above the word propitiation, there's a pencil in the pew if you didn't bring one. I guess, there's, I guess there's still pencils in the pew. All right. H-I-L. A-S. K-O-M-A-I. That is the Greek word for propitiation. Alaskomai. Alaskomai is the word. It's a phenomenal word. Propitiation. And it briefly or simply means that God, uh, his wrath is appeased in your life when you believe that Jesus died for his sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. 
The moment you believe that, the gospel takes action upon your life, removes the 13 judicial charges them, and replaces it with a positive aspect to your life. Takes away the raft of God and gives you propitiation through the blood of Christ. That's one of the nine things we look at when we take part in the Eucharist of the cup, the blood. Propitiation. Now, God demonstrated his love towards us in that he sent his son. This is why the, the love of God is so powerful that when you believed his son, he removes the raft of God and gives you propitiation, which means the raft of God can never affect your life ever again. The raft of God can never affect your life ever again. Listen to me. That's how much God loves you. That is how much God loves you. You need, don't let anybody take that away from you. you. You stand your ground on faith on the word of God. And there's a Bible verse that says it. Titus, on your paper, Titus, third chapter, verses four through seven. It is so good I wrote the whole thing out. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, circle that word, appeared. He saved us not on the basis of our works, Romans 4, 4 and 5. He saved us by grace, not works. Which we have done in righteousness. Let me tell you, religion, religious works won't do it. Altruistic works, good works won't do it. But the love of God will. He saved us not according to the deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, because we deserve everything we got according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing. Notice those are two words that go to the Holy Spirit. Regeneration and renewing are the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that you get of one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit at salvation. Boom! You get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the positive side of it is regeneration and renewing in your life. Because you have been born again, you are a new man in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And regeneration, you are always living in regeneration, and you're always living in renewing by the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. If the church could ever get those two things connected, regeneration and renewing, the church would get on fire and we'd see revival sweep across the world. We'd see it sweep across the world. That would, be, that would be my great desire. The Holy Spirit whom, the Holy Spirit whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. What's he talking about? He's talking about the love of God. He's talking about the Holy Spirit that came because of the love of God. He regenerated us. He renewed us. He did eight works for us in the point of salvation. Whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. See, we don't even know what it means to be richly. Listen, so that, watch this now, so that being justified by his grace, that's salvation, he's our savior. We would be made heirs according to the hope, confident expectation of eternal life. Now look at Romans 5.8. We're still talking about God demonstrated his love towards us. We're still talking about 
How, how is it that God demonstrated his love towards us? Who is the us? Us in the world have gotten saved. We now understand that. Listen to what he says. God demonstrated. In other words, God wanted you to see something, and so he demonstrated it for you. He put this part, and then he put that part, and then he put that part, then he put it together and went like, that's the gospel. Christ died on a cross six hours, was buried three days, raised from the dead, demonstrated. God demonstrated his own love towards us, displayed it, made it public, identified it. You could tag it. In that while we were yet sinners, that's Adam saying, still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life you know what's a wonderful thing about being saved is that it works every day in a positive way in our life he talks about that in Ephesians 2, 2 8 9 and then talks about it in verse 10 were his workmanship created in Christ Jesus' business. Ephesians 4.16, Paul says, May the Lord direct our hearts. Boy, wouldn't that be good? Wouldn't that be good? Well, there's my prayer. May the Lord direct our hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. Didn't you love that idea? steadfastness of Christ. May the Lord direct our hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. We need both of those. We need them daily. We need them often. Point number three. The excelling love of God watch this now, was poured out into every church age believer's heart by the indwelling Holy Spirit at the moment of believing that Jesus died for his sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. Now listen to me. The perfect love of God. The word perfect, write this on your paper. The word perfect. You're going to see this in a minute. T-E-L-E-I-O-S. T-E-L-E-I-O-S, teleos. It's the word perfect. It's the word perfect. It means mature. It means complete, finished. You've reached a goal or an end. When you see the word perfect, that's what it means in the Greek language. It means mature. It means complete. It means finished. It means that it has reached an end or a goal. So there's no confusion about what the word perfect means. I don't want you to be confer to, I don't want you to figure out what does that word mean and look it up in a dictionary someday or ask somebody that don't know what it means. So I'm telling you what that word means. When Paul uses that word, that's exactly what it means. Now look at look at Romans 5:5 5, 5 on your paper. Hope does not disappoint. Now, hope means confident expectation. It's elpis. I don't know if I put it on your paper because we talk about it so much. E-L-P-I-S, -E elpis. It means confident expectation. And hope doesn't, doesn't disappoint. When you have God's hope, when you have divine hope, it doesn't disappoint. Listen, when it's based on your, when it's based on your norms and standards, it always disappoints. Listen to me, church. When, it, when, it, when hope is built on your, on your human norms and standards, it's always disappointing. But when it's based on God's 
divine viewpoint, the Word of God, it never disappoints. So why would you keep going to build your hopes knowing that the wind is going to blow it and the water is going to wash it away? The hope that I'm talking about and Paul's talking about and God's talking about is confident expectation built on the Word of God. And so here we go. Hope doesn't disappoint. That's because of divine viewpoint thinking. Because the love of God, and I'm talking about per the perfect love of God, the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, when was he given to us? At the point of salvation. And what did he do at the point of salvation? He poured out the perfect love of God in my heart. Boom. I have one, that's 100% the love of God. And he gave it to me, salvation. Now, and we always have it. But it takes spiritual maturity to appreciate it. You got to grow in the word of God to have an appreciation for that love of God that sent his son that puts up with all of our foolishness and still loves us unconditionally and unselfishly. Because that's what agape means. It's a selfless love and it's unconditional. You need to put both those words down when you're studying agape. That's what, that's what he's talking about here. A-G-A-P-E, agape. And, we're to, and listen, it's 100% God. It operates in our life 100% God. How do I know it? Because I have 100% the Holy Spirit who is 100% God. Agreed? I make that up, people. I mean, it's God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It is the love of God that is given to me through the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's 100 percenter. My goodness, you ought to be happy about that idea. I mean, you should be happy about that. So you, so you don't get misunderstand. Watch, I made three points. Watch underneath there. Let us make sure that we understand what Paul is saying. The perfect love of God has been poured out within every church aid believer's heart at salvation. I want you to get that down. That's a very important point. Number two, the perfect love of God was given through the indwelling Holy Spirit of salvation. Boom, that's number two. Here's number three. The indwelling Holy Spirit was given to each church age believer at the moment of salvation. And he is, write this down, he is the source of God's love. He is the source of God's love. The Word of God just demonstrates it, just exemplifies it, just teaches about it, and gives us perimeters of how it should be manifested. And that, you see, listen to me. We as church age believers have now become God's demonstration of God's love, right? We are. We're the people that were crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. And we're the people that God has chosen to put the Holy Spirit in and the love of God in so that the Holy Spirit can manifest, can demonstrate, can, can bring an appearance, a public display of the love of God. For the love of God, do we not understand the love of God? It's really, really important. And this word is teleos. It means that when it's given, it's given in maturity. It's given complete. It's, it's a finish. It reaches an end or a goal. Well, I'm just telling you. Therefore, the perfect love of God, that 100 percenter, is within every believer's heart. Do you understand that? Say amen if you do. Or Hua. Uh. 
the issue, listen to me, therefore the issue is how to access it to yourself and to give that perfect love of God to others because that's what we're encouraged to do today in our lesson text, agreed? And they were doing it. He said, what I want you to do, you've, you've got this. You've learned this. You've got it, and you're doing it. What I want you to do is spread that love of God further. Agreed? Thank you. This brings me back to my lesson text of the fourth chapter, verse 9 and 10. Because in that lesson text, we are asked or encouraged by Paul to excel the love of God further out from our, 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 sphere, our sphere of influence. Push this thing. The, the love of God is, is for you, but not to be kept, but to be given away. It's 100%. You can never give it all away because you can't give all of God away because God is forever. You have eternal life as a reminder. Give this love of God away. You are forever. And listen, we need to be thinking how far that we can spread the gospel of Christ and the love of God out, out, out from us. What a joy it is to bring somebody into the kingdom of God. The moment we do, we know that the Holy Spirit of God is going to enter their life and is going to flood their heart with the love of God. And they're going to have to weed this out in their life, the difference between human love and divine love. And after you reach spiritual maturity through your growth in the Word of God, you won't even know the difference in them. In your life, you'll, you, you won't even notice the difference. You'll work through all that selfishness that, that doesn't give them, God, I'll show you, you do that to me. You are just, uh, I'm not. That, that's not the love of God. That's the way human love works. They have their own agenda. The love of God is selfless and it's unconditional. You haven't given it if you've got strings attached to it. God put all the strings to his love. You just put it out. He'll, he, he'll, he'll manifest it. You can't, man, listen, our job is just to share the love of God. How we treat other people, as well as sharing the gospel, is how we treat other people. How we treat other people. And, and how we treat them in the name of Jesus Christ. You know, when you meet other people, you should say to yourself, you should say to yourself, even if you can't say to them, I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. Say it to yourself, say. A, a waitress comes up and waits on your table, and you say, I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. A policeman walks up to your car, writes you a ticket. People accuse you of things that, that are not true. You and God know it, and that's enough. And they come to you with all of that. What do you do? I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. That's a trigger. Because you let the love of God deal with them. You let the love of God. You just go back to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You don't get in the flesh. You don't get in the flesh. You get in the Holy Spirit, and you let the Holy Spirit minister the love of God. They need the love of God, and you don't know because you want to run them over with a car. You don't want to put up with that. Turn it over to the one who does. Turn it over to the Holy Spirit, whose job is to put up with all that stuff, who knows the love, how the love of God works in everybody's life differently and yet the same. Greet everybody in the name of Jesus Christ in your heart. It will go a long way. There are two divine operating grace assets. There are, I'm at verse four, I'm at point four. 
there are two divine grace operating assets necessary for the spiritual advancing believers, such as you here today, for excelling the love of God to the world. One is you must walk by the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit, and two, you must walk by the faith cycle drill. You need to learn that. That's it, buddy. That is it. And it's interesting that in Galatians 5.16, the word walk is, is peripateo. And in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 7, walk by faith, the word walk is peripateo. In Galatians, what's interesting is this word walk, peripateo, is a present active imperative, second person plural. Walk by means of the Holy Spirit. He says, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. That's the sin nature. That's a present active imperative. The imperative is a command in the Greek language. The present tense is a standing command. Present tense means continuously. Continuously. I'm talking about every minute of every day of every week of every year until you die. <laughs> I know you don't like the present tense, but there it is. <laughs> the present tense. Active, the active voice is volitional. You're commanded to walk. You, you need to be obedient. It's not about how you feel. It's about how God feels, about how you feel. Galatians 5.16, if, if you walk by the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That's, that's Galatians 5.16. If you went down to verse 22 and 23, I'm still in Galatians 5. If you drop down to 22.23, you know what he says? The fruit of the Spirit. And he lists nine. He lists nine. You know what the first one is? Love. Starts right off with him. It's the fruit of the what? It's the fruit of the Spirit. Where does the Spirit live? And what are you supposed to do? You're commanded to walk in the part of the Spirit, right? And it's His job. Your, your job is to open your life up, and His job is to love other people out of your life, <laughs> out, out, out of your skin out of your skin. Think about that. He says, I want you to walk in the spirit and I don't want you to walk in the flesh. For me, I just keep in my mind when I meet somebody, greet them in the Lord Jesus Christ. I greet you in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my mindset. Deal with the spiritual life, not the carnal life with this individual. That's for me. That's how I deal with it. Listen to Paul said in Galatians 5.15. If you bite and devour one another, children of God, take care that you are not consumed by one another. I heard a preacher one time when I was really young in the ministry preach on this sermon there. And he compared two snakes that grabbed each other by the tail and swallowed each other. He said, that's what this is like. Consumed each other. It's not one consume another, it's the two consume each other. It's like the snake who grabs one snake and they consume each other. Walking by the faith cycle drill. You know, faith comes by hearing, believing. The drill is that you go through the cycle. Faith comes by hearing, by believing, by applying, by completing. You need to be familiar with that. I mean, this is how the Christian life has lived in dynamic power. You got to walk in the spirit. You got to walk by faith. Now, in 2 second, in second Corinthians 5, 7, when he says walk, it's a present act indicative, not a command. 
and it's based on context, what, what, what the writer is talking about. Colossians 3.14, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Listen to this one, 1 John 2.5, whoever keeps his word, that's God's word, whoever keeps God's word, to him the love of God was, has, has truly been perfected, matured. By this we know that we are in him. Write these down. Now, I gave you 1 John 2, 5. Write down 1 John 4, 8 through 14. Pay attention to verse 12. Verse 8 says, God is love. Don't you love that? God is love. God is love. Verse, you want to write down 1 John 4, 8 through 14, and then you want to write down the fourth chapter, verse 19. I love that one. It says we love. Why? Because he first loved us. Never forget that. We love others because he first loved us. He put us on that game. <laughs> he put us on that game. He, he, with that love that he loves you, you love others. That's selfishly and unconditionally. You know, when we... We looked at the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit, of, the fruit he gives nine fruit of the Holy Spirit's ministry, identifying it. The key is love. It's called a fruit. When I was a little kid, I was raised on a farm. I, we, raised, we raised cherries, but our neighbors raised apples and pears and a lot of fruit. We all sold our, our product, our, our, our fruit products to Gerber, Gerber baby food. They had a factory in Fremont, which 30, 40 miles from where we lived. When I was a little boy, my grandfather would take me around to the different orchards, would ask me what kind of trees they were. Well, I didn't have a problem when they had fruit on them. <laughs> and so when I was a little boy, I learned fruits by my grandfather taking me around. He said, that's an apple. And then he would tell me what kind of an apple it was, you know. And he would tell me how to identify it. Like, you know, you look on the bottom, and it's got these little five bumps, that, you know, and all that kind of stuff. He, and then as I grew up and got a little older and got down, that I, I knew that, that I was in an apple orchard or a pear orchard or whatever. Then he'd take me out when there was no fruit. And he'd say, what kind of tree is that? What kind of orchard do you think that is? And I'd go, well, I, other than the fact I knew what it was last year, but he'd take me to a place that I wasn't familiar with and ask me what it was. And I'd go, I don't know. So you know, what he, you know what his second lesson to me was about? Leaves. You know a tree by its leaves, not just its fruits. Matthew, the seventh chapter, uh, they came to Jesus and did that, and he said, you know, you, you'll, you'll know them by their fruit. <laughs> when I read that, I think, yeah, you might have to learn, you might have to know them by their leaves. <laughs> That's what I think of as a kid. There's a lot to be seen about people other than just fruit. There's even the, the bark of these trees are different. I mean, I grew up, I, I learned a lot by my grandfather starting me off uh, because I was just a curious kid and I wanted to learn. My grandfather's a great teacher. Let's pray. Well, Father, we're not just told to love others, but we're told to excel still more. Challenges today through this message in our own lives. Spread the love of God. Spread it. 
spread the love of God. And, and, and as a congregation, Father, we take this all serious. We take this all serious. I am thankful that Paul reminds us as a church that how important that is to the world around us as well as the church around us. And he says, I want you to, listen, practice this love of God that is, requires selfishly, no, unselfishly and unconditionally. Practice it at home and then carry that out where, where you're not distracted by wind and water. You're not going to be distracted from it. You're going to be able to, to spread the love of God into the hearts of people through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Teach us that, Father, to excel, to excel still more in spreading the love of God throughout our community, throughout our, our county, throughout our state, throughout our nation, throughout the world, Father. We thank you for this. We thank you for these that have come our way today, Father, by the automobile and the internet to visit with us. I pray, Father, they need to study this lesson two or three times to get it. This is not just something you can quickly grab. This is, and listen, it's an, it's, Father, it's an enormous, enormous ministry opportunity for us to understand, to excel in the love of God. In Jesus' name, amen.